Pantages, Chapter 6, Trial of the Century. The Rape Trial of Alexander Pantages from October 4th to 27th in 1929 was one of the most covered news stories in American history. During the duration of the trial, it was the number one news story in the world. Hundreds of newspaper stories. Exaggerated headlines and photos, including a famous photograph of Eunice Pringle holding what she claimed was a dress soiled with Pantages semen. The defendant was Alexander Pantages. He was charged with the crime of rape. The chief defense lawyers were Earl M. Daniels, W.J. Ford, Jerry Geisler, and W.I. Gilbert. The chief prosecutors, Burton Fitz and Robert P. Stewart. The judge, Charles Frick. The place of the trial, Los Angeles, California. The Alexander Pantages case marked a turning point in California law as the state Supreme Court ruled on appeal that where rape was alleged, if the girl was under 18, evidence of her previous sexual activity was admissible to discredit her testimony that she had been criminally attacked. The case also established a national reputation for defense attorney Jerry Geisler, who went on to handle many Hollywood cases. From the time of his arrest until the end of the trial, Pantages maintained his innocence, claiming he was blackmailed, but never naming the source. In the vaunted court of public opinion, however, he was already guilty. Public opinion was outraged at the goatish Greek millionaire who had deflowered a native daisy from Garden Grove, California. Pantages spoke broken English with a thick accent and displayed European airs that many Americans found pretentious. Early in 1929, he made overtures to sell his theaters, but he seemed ambivalent about the idea, perhaps using it as a negotiating ploy. But after his arrest, perhaps under duress, he sold his remaining properties. Pantages' rape trial reveals something of the complex relationship between immigrants and Hollywood. The myth that Joseph P. Kennedy framed Pantages gained social currency after the trials. Kennedy may have suffered his own discrimination for being a Catholic in a Protestant nation, but by the time he arrived in Hollywood in the early 1920s, he came as a white savior to a chaotic, sin-stained, morally loose industry. In the end, he saved nothing but his enormous bank account that swelled during his time in the industry. Nevertheless, by 1928, Kennedy knew that a successful film studio, in his case, RKO, that he more or less created, needed theaters to guarantee an exhibition of the movies it produced. The only major film theater chain not owned by a Hollywood studio at the time was Pantages. In the early days of 1929, Kennedy made overtures to buy the Pantages theaters. Pantages was open to the idea, but he was also coy and uncommitted. One day, the film trades announced an imminent sale of parts of the Pantages chain, only some days later to be replaced with notices that he had changed his mind. This went on for some months, and in frustration, Kennedy supposedly hatched a scheme with the teenage Eunice Pringle to end this grimy form of gamesmanship. This rumor soon became a legend and the basis on which the rape trials were remembered. Pantages' defense was that the young woman had thrown herself at him like a tigress, tearing at his shirt, suspenders, and trousers, and screaming at him. It had taken all his strength to push the athletic young dancer from his office. Particularly virulent was the Los Angeles Examiner newspaper coverage of the trial. Owned by famed press baron and anti-immigrant apostle William Randolph Hearst, the Los Angeles Examiner was strongly antagonistic towards the Greek-accented Pantages, while portraying Pringle as the innocent victim, already convicting Pantages before the trial even started in September 1929. Pantages was portrayed as variously alone, aloof, cold, emotionless, effete, and European, while the native Pringle was victimized through portraits with her family, emotional outbursts in court, and lengthy interviews in the press, and always with a sense of decorum and empathy. Pringle claimed she had arrived to get an audition with Alexander Pantages himself. She had trained her life for this moment since the age of 11. She had been studying and practicing the art of dancing, and preparing herself for the stage. She had also come several times before, but the impresario had given her the polite brush off. He found her act too suggestive. 
This time Pringle was determined to book her act, which was partnered with two others, including the play's author, a Russian émigré named Nicolas Dunay, a castaway Russian prince, aspiring screenwriter and producer, who acted as her agent and lover. The two lived together in a Hollywood motel. It was a mildly lewd song and dance routine that involved barbells. Pringle arrived at the theater wearing a little red velvet jacket and a red hat, puriently designed, according to Pantages lawyers, to get his attention. Pringle asked to see Pantages immediately upon entering the building. By chance, Pantages came out of his office and saw her in the waiting area. He inquired about her presence there, and she replied that she came to audition for him. He told her that he had an appointment with his barber, and he could discuss the matter further after he returned. He then led her into the main auditorium, where Eddie Leonard was talking, singing, dancing, offering glorious vaudeville, according to the Pantages ad in The Examiner on August 10, 1929, and then promptly left to get his hair cut. A short while later, according to the testimony again, Pantages returned and led her from the auditorium into a small mezzanine side office between the first and second floors of the building. The next 30 minutes are a matter of conflicting testimony, both at the preliminary hearing in August and the actual trial that followed on October 3, 1929. According to Pringle, she was physically molested, while Pantages maintained that Pringle had come to frame him for an attack he did not commit. His account would be repeated in the press coverage of the arrest. Pantages, along with Pringle and several eyewitnesses, were taken into police custody for further questioning. Los Angeles Examiner, August 10, 1929, reported. Witnesses were not able to completely corroborate either side's testimony, although her screams at the time of the escape from the small side office had garnered attention from many in surrounding offices in the building. From the moment the story broke the next day, on Saturday, August 10, 1929, in the Examiner, the narrative painted Pringle as the innocent, aggrieved party and Pages as the aloof, powerful cynic seemingly unmoved by the serious allegations leveled against him. In one of the accompanying photos, Pringle is seated, looking devastatingly forlorn, her hair askew, and wearing her torn dress in the adjacent photo of Pantages, about a third the size of Pringle's. He is in a light suit, one leg crossed, cigarette in hand, in a suggestively Levantine manner, and looking particularly uninterested, even bored. Such combustible imagery seems designed to alienate Pantages to the reading public, to distance him from his Americanness, and to push him into the role of the exotic, perhaps even the exotically brutal. Furthering her portrayal as the aggrieved party, beneath Pringle's photo is a two-column article relating her side of the story. No such reporting is offered for Pantages, and thus her version of the events takes precedence in the coverage, which is repeated throughout the length of the case until its conclusion in late October 1929. By contrast, the more subdued Los Angeles Times offers not a front page story with a banner headline, but one buried deep inside the paper, section three, page two, with two photos, one of a less incendiary police mugshot type photo, hair askew, possible mark on chin, looking solemnly off screen, while Pantages is shown in a posed miniature photo, the uncredited story provides straightforward coverage of the Pringle accusations and Page's arrest without any sidebar article to heighten her side of the story. It is hard to discern a narrative from the Times coverage. Its reporting is straightforward and seemingly impartial. The next day's edition of The Examiner, we read front page headline, Pantages Freed on $25,000 Bail. In this account, Pringle signs the formal complaint against Pantages and to further prove his guilt, the article reveals that she has been subjected to a medical examination early in the day by Dr. Hannah Beatty, county juvenile physician. Dr. Beatty's report substantiates the girl's charges that she had been attacked. Meanwhile, if the article is to be believed, Pantages continues to appear oblivious to the severity of the charges. Still maintaining an air of entire unconcern, Pantages appeared for arraignment. He claims that the events were a setup, while the article notes Pringle's response. In near tears, she branded Pantages charges of frame-up and absurdity. Another sidebar article to the main story on the second day of the newspaper coverage of the case gives further empathetic voice to Eunice and her mother. All I ask is justice, sobbed Mrs. Irene Pringle. 
Eunice Pringle's mother, in a state of nervous collapse, following her daughter's charges, and was under the care of friends yesterday in her apartment. Only a mother who has raised a daughter can understand what this must mean to me. She continued between spells of weeping while her daughter attempted to comfort her. Such rhetorical narrative construction brutalizes Pantages, making him appear as a callous, wanton sexual beast. Pringle's own voice only furthers this emotional appeal, delivered as it is with simple, cogent urgency. I never had the slightest suspicion of Mr. Pantages. Why should I? He was old enough to be my grandfather, and until he took hold of my hand as I sat in his private office, it never entered my head that anything might be wrong. But oh, how suddenly he changed. It seems like a nightmare to me now. If it is the last thing I do on earth, I want to pay him back for this terrible thing he has done to me. I have been a good girl all my life, and no one can point the slightest finger of suspicion at me for anything I have ever done. I have had boyfriends, yes, but never was the friendship any more than passing. I was just in love with two things, my mother and my career. And now I feel as though I would be better if I were dead. This most horrible thing has happened to me. This was reported in the Los Angeles Examiner, August 11th, 1929. The photo of an ebullient, cherubic, perhaps even naively coy Pringle is a powerful contrast to the previous pictures of Pringle in a torn dress with her violated, shell-shocked, demoralized expression. The goal here is to show how far into human misery she has descended. There is no similarly contrasting photo of Pantages, as if his emotional state during the trial is irrelevant. Further corroborating the innocence of Eunice Pringle were sworn statements to the court by those who knew her, as in the case of an operatic tenor and well-known radio singer, Amato Fernandez, who told District Attorney Burton Fitz the girl's reputation was above reproach. The newspaper reported no such individual stepping forward to vouch for Pantages' character, at least not reported in the examiner. If there was unity on the side of those supporting Pringle, the opposite was the case for Pantages. If the examiner's account of events is to be believed. Witnesses for Pantages, such as the staff from his downtown theater, were not quoted in the examiner as supporting their boss. In fact, the newspaper reports confusion on Pantages' side. As indicated on Wednesday, August 14, 1929, in its front page, his press agent, who was there on the fateful afternoon when the alleged rape took place, suddenly disappeared from his home, along with vague rumblings of mystery girls attempting to hush the entire affair, seemingly on behalf of Pantages. Despite the vast media attention and the apparent emotional toll of the case on Pringle, she remains sensitive and resolute in her claims of assault. Thus, the examiner reports on Wednesday, August 14, 1929, of her emotional condition. The girl, pale with dark rings under her eyes, had to be supported by her companion as she walked through the corridors of the Hall of Justice into Fitt's private office. She appeared on the verge of collapse. Her story doesn't vary one iota, Fitz stated following his talk with the girl. It is exactly the same as she told the night Pantages was jailed. Implicit in this coverage are the descriptions pale, with dark rings under her eyes, and supported by her companion. That suggests scenes out of a melodramatic stage play explicitly designed to capture readers' interest and to turn the entire court proceedings into sensational theater, complete with a protagonist, an antagonist, and various supporting characters. Significantly, for the first time in the August 14, 1929 account, a photo is revealed of the little mezzanine room, as the examiner calls it, where the alleged actions took place. Above this photo is another picture of Pringle, this time sitting dejectedly next to District Attorney Fitz. It is hard to miss the dramatic connection between her crushed sadness in the photo above with the events that took place in the photo of the office beneath. The blurring between journalism and soap opera drama is additionally heightened by the arrival of the first byline in the examiner's coverage by staff reporter Harry Lang beginning on August 15, 1929. Under the headline, Girl Faints on Stand at Hearing, Lang introduces the setting and characters in dramatic, tense, staccato fashion. Before Municipal Judge Leonard Wilson yesterday, 
The preliminary hearing in the Pantages case, Eunice Pringle, the 17-year-old dancer on the witness stand, at the defendant's table before her, Alexander Pantages, gray-haired millionaire theater man, facing possible imprisonment for the rest of his natural life for what the girl swears he did to her. This type of reporting seems designed to leave the reader breathless. The journalistic fashion of the lead paragraph describing the main events of the story is jettisoned for pure suspense, tension, and drama. Readers might be forgiven if they thought they were reading a dramatic scenario rather than a modern American newspaper. Eunice Pringle then faints dead away on the stand, according to Lang. She recovers quickly, however, and continues her testimony, suggesting in this action the heroic determination of one committed to writing justice. And how does Pantages react to her testimony? Pantages sat there solemnly, listening to her claims. But the paper also reminds the readers that Pantages had smirked and smiled the night they arrested him. He didn't smile today. A crowd estimated at 500 packed the courtroom. Courthouse personnel, the account read, said it was the biggest crowd that's tried to get into a court hearing in a long time. Hundreds milled about the corridors, and a lane had to be open for Pantages when he left the courtroom. His face was worth nothing then, the piece dramatically in tones, as reported in the Los Angeles Examiner on August 15, 1929. The burgeoning dramatic elements overwhelm the journalism and render it trivial if not spurious. Only a writer of fiction would be interested in such details as the temperature in the room, well over 100 degrees hot, or the use of sexist stereotyping, women who had struggled to get in, struggled again to get out before they fainted, to further heighten the drama. Most attention, however, is paid to the principals themselves, particularly Pringle, who receives far more columns as well as photos than Pantages throughout the coverage of the case. In the August 15th edition of The Examiner, we see a portrayal of her as the lone adjutant struggling in her determination to obtain justice. And over on the couch in the corner, by the breath of air that came in from the open window, lay Eunice Pringle the plaintiff, eyes closed, face waxen. She might have been dead for all the movement that was in her. Wanting to embed this impression to the readers, who by this time might themselves feel under attack and powerless, above the sidebar is a picture of Pantages, seated imposingly with his numerous well-dressed lawyers still around him, staring rather intently at the proceedings. Beneath this photo is one of Pringle, as if crushed from the one of Pantages above, showing her slumped in the witness stand, hand to forehead, and looking utterly wretched and devastated. The unmistakable impression of the lone girl up against the battery of expensive and presumably ruthless lawyers could not be missed. Yet, we are told that Pringle's parents were sitting next to her, fanning her, a supportive act which, when told in a melodramatic manner, simply reiterates the difference between the two sides in the case. The young woman with her family supporting her contrasted against the powerful phalanx of Pantages and his high-powered attorneys sitting at the defendant's table. It is interesting to note that despite the fact that his two sons, Rodney and Lloyd, as well as his natural daughter, Carmen, joined their father at the trial, there is not a single published photo of him with any member of his family in the pages of the examiner. Lang masterly adds elements designed to emphasize sympathetic portrayals of Pringle to the reading public. On August 15th, Lang reported in the LA Examiner, Seems as though she just doesn't care anymore whether she's alive or dead, since this happened. Strange to see her like this, if you'd ever seen her dancing in bright and merry like she used to be. He uses words to build characteristics, not out of any particular concern for human complexity, but for the sole purpose of furthering dramatic effect. The use of visual cues is just another example of how the reader is expected to interpret the action. In one particular example, he has Judge Leonard Wilson pound his gavel, but he does so as the only cool temperature in the perspiration-drenched courtroom, thus establishing the judge's authority and his ability to remain calm under pressure, lending some dignity to the court proceedings. Even if she wilts under the immense preliminary hearing pressure, Pringle's testimony clearly damages Pantages' defense, as it would again during the actual trial. As much as Pantages' lawyers tried to attack her credibility, Pringle persists in maintaining her story. On Friday, August 16th, Pringle is grilled by Pantages' lawyers. Question after question they had read at her, questions of the tiniest detail, 
evidently in hope that somehow she might become confused, contradict herself, give them an opening whereby to impeach her story. But Eunice failed them. It was no easy experience for a 17-year-old girl. Hollywood law partners W.J. Ford and W.I. Gilbert asked bright junior attorney Jerry Geisler to cross-examine. He led Pringle back and forth through her story several times. Then he asked, Did your studies in dramatic school include a course in memory training? Yes, Pringle responded. Were you taught to express your emotions dramatically? Yes, she said. Geisler later told the media, in defense of his client's case, that although Miss Pringle had told her pitiful tale several times to the press and to the law, she had scarcely varied a comma or a single breath each time she said her story. I pointed out that her story seemed rehearsed, as only a girl who was studying acting would have rehearsed it. Next, Pantages' attorneys asked his accuser, Is that the dress you were wearing the day you said you were attacked? No, Pringle shyly responded. Eunice Pringle showed up to court dressed like a 13-year-old schoolgirl, blue dress, Dutch collar and cuffs, black stockings and Mary Jane shoes, small black bag and black gloves, long hair down her back, and tied with a bow. Geisler asked the judge to order her to dress the next day in the same outfit and makeup she had worn to the Pantages Theater. The jurors then saw not a schoolgirl, but a well-endowed young woman in a revealing and, to use Geisler's words, slinky scarlet dress. Now his cross-examination tried to explore earlier acts of unchastity on her part, including a live-in affair with a man twice her age. But the judge sustained the prosecution's objections and cut off the line of questioning. From the editorial pages of the Examiner on August 14th, under the headline, District Attorney Properly Takes Personal Charge in Grave Prosecution, the op-ed launches into a carefully worded attack against Pantages and the wealthy, and presumably the Hollywood lifestyle he represents. This lifestyle is a code phrase for the Jewish immigrants who ran Hollywood. Citing the Pantages case as one of the most important prosecutions of recent years, the editorial bluntly states that the whole machinery of justice leans heavily upon the courage and intelligence of the prosecuting authorities, as if to remind its audience of the stakes involved in the trial and of Pantages' privileged position, it offers a clear warning. No matter how wealthy an accused person may be, his wealth should not make a particle of difference to the rigor with which this case is prosecuted. The examiner further radiates its populist tones in the editorial, a Hearst trademark, by adding that, his wealth should not of itself carry the implication of guilt, but neither should it give the slightest advantage over the poorest person in the community accused of a similar offense. Standing as the pillar in all this is the heroic district attorney, Fitz, who is to be heartily commended, the editorial goes on to state, and who is determined to make every employer's office in Los Angeles safe for every young and defenseless girl. And most tellingly, at the end of the editorial, is the admonition that our womanhood must be as secure in its virtue as every citizen should be secure of life itself. The admonition to protect womanhood is expected of newspapers as guardians of a community's morality. The suggestion that women required the protection of men smacks to us today of sexism, not only by implying that women needed such protection in the first place, but by inferring that someone like Eunice Pringle was simply too weak to stand up to sexual predators like Pantages. In a backhanded way, this admonition simply reinforces the innocent predator narrative under the protective auspices of the examiner, while it casts all the moral male leaders, from prosecuting attorney Fitz to publisher William Randolph Hearst, as not only pillars of decent God-fearing community, but as protectors of the vulnerable sex. The examiner's coverage of the preliminary hearing that followed the events of August 9, 1929 was only a dress rehearsal for the actual trial that began on October 3rd in Los Angeles County Superior Court and was named one of the most noted criminal cases of a decade by the Seattle Post Intelligencer on October 28th. While it is known from coverage that Pantages' two sons, Lloyd and Rodney, and daughter Carmen accompanied their father during the trial, there was never a photo of them taken together. Often Pantages was pictured isolated and forlorn, the lone wolf, 
as both Variety in its November 20th issue and the Los Angeles Times on February 18, 1936 called him. This visual construction of the single individual extended to Pringle only when she testified. Otherwise, she was framed with court officials and her parents. If it was Pantages' loneliness in the photos that hinted at his isolation from the rest of society, the other trope of shadows and darkness that enveloped his image was, as screenwriting historian Mark Norman would attest, an updated Orientalism. Exotic Levantines in period movie spectacles had been a staple of early American cinema, and audiences were used to the convention of the dark foreigner as a powerful symbol of sexual depravity and evil. It did not require much in the way of visual cueing to make the degenerative association understood by newspaper readers of the Pantages case. Meanwhile, adding class to his ethnic difference, the reading public was constantly reminded of Pantages' wealth and mogulhood, as well as his Greek past, his thick accent, and passionate testimony were rhetorical constructions and reminders of his immigrant past. Pringle's testimony, punctuated by emotional outbursts and stops, was reported in such a way as to tug at the reader's heart, suggesting that this trial was more than a he said, she said battle, but a fight between a youthful, innocent American versus a corrupt Levantine immigrant. One could read Pantages' refusal to speak or to pose for the press, a refusal revealed by his own lawyers at the end of the trial, as unwittingly shining the spotlight on Pringle, and with it soliciting greater empathy for her. While his silence facilitated his demonization, it was not its primary cause. The use of doctored photos during the manslaughter trials of Fatty Arbuckle by Hearst's San Francisco Examiner, photos that paint him in a predatory style, suggests that such practice was not an isolated situation, but standard Hearstian policy. Like its Los Angeles cousin, the San Francisco Examiner went out of its way to make the accused Arbuckle appear guilty on October 10th after a turbulent cross-examination of W.C. Hale, motion picture bit player, D.A. Burton Fitz dipped right into it when William Jobelman, publicity manager from Pantages, took the stand. Still on Pantages' payroll, he took the stand as a reluctant witness. After a full day of hammering, a lunch break, late in the day, the DA got him to admit Pantages, told me to tell an untruth, offering him money to say he was in the room. Yesterday, Jay Sheridan testified to being offered money by Pantages to say he was in the room too. On October 11th, Roy Keane, former manager's assistant, and Tilly Russo, former usherette, recount the same offers of bribes by Pantages. Keane testified that his employer directly ordered him to tell the DA that a desk, which Pantages had put in the attack room following the arrest, had been there previously and that the room had been used as an office, and to tell Russo to remember only three minutes had elapsed from the time Miss Pringle left the theater balcony until she heard the screams. Russo testified that Pantages told her, this is your statement, that the Pringle girl went in and came out of the theater alone. Russo testified she saw Pantages bring Pringle into the theater, lead her waiting about half an hour, then escort her from the balcony into the room. Under direct cross, Ford got an admission that she was not wearing a watch. Did you tell me Attorney General Gilbert was only about five minutes? Yes, she said. Now, did you later tell your cousin Marie Lowell and your grandfather at your home that the reason you changed your testimony concerning this length of time was because the DA threatened to put you in jail? Fitz jumped to his feet, roaring an objection against the admission of such unfair and untrue and entirely improper cross-examination. He was overruled. Miss Russo answered no. Faltering, as she left the witness stand, Miss Russo fainted in the arms of a spectator when she reached the doorway of the crowded courtroom. Doctors and nurses from the city jail hospital took her in charge and later issued a statement that she was suffering from nervousness but was not seriously ill. Court was adjourned. On October 12th, District Attorney Burton Fitz complained bitterly to San Diego District Attorney Connolly when instead of having bad check charges dropped against Sheridan for his testimony, Connolly had raised the bail so high Sheridan had to go to jail. 
They knew that if Sheridan's bail was raised to $10,000, he would be unable to produce, Fitz charged. Then, if he was called again as a witness, I would be placed in the embarrassing position of having to tell the jury he was in jail. Fitz told Connolly his office no longer had relationships with the San Diego prosecutor. According to Fitz, Connolly denied he personally had anything to do with the case and promised an investigation. On October 14th, Harold H. Doley, private detective and former San Francisco Prohibition agent, pleaded not guilty to a charge of attempting to bribe a state's witness in the Pantages case. Doley was accused of offering Ivan Samsonoff money if he would do everything in his power for Pantages when he took the stand to testify. Samson was a friend of Eunice Pringle. The trial was set for November 12th. Mrs. Catherine Bellis, a policewoman at the Juvenile Bureau, Mrs. Bellis said she undressed Pringle a short time after the girl ran screaming from Pantages conference room. Her clothing was torn and must, and she had bites and bruises on her body. In all, there were eight bites. When asked to describe how Pringle first appeared to Bellis, well, Miss Pringle was sobbing and nervous and trembling, and her clothes were all torn. Did you undress her? Yes. What did you find? I found a number of bruises and bites. The bites were all over her body. She then described the nature and position of the marks. Was her clothing badly torn? It was in the same condition in that regard as it is now. The only difference is that her wearing apparel has been cleaned. C.C. Harden said on the order of Roy Keane, he moved a small table into the room to give the appearance of an office. He testified the order was given by Pantages in an attempt to discredit Miss Pringle's account of a conference room. On October 15th, the state rested and the defense began. Pantages defense attorney, Joseph Ford, crossed police chemist Rex Welsh. He got Welsh to contradict prior testimony regarding age and formation on bacteriological figures regarding Pringle's clothes. Ford attacked Welsh for failing to keep records and for faulty recollection. Didn't you guess at them? The attorney interposed at one time in his questioning. No, not to the best of my recollection, Welch replied. On redirect examination by the state, Welch said specimens he had discovered were peculiar to the two principals in the case. When Welch was unable to recall figures he had given previously concerning results of some of his tests, he admitted that he was confused over the numerous cases he had cited. As a matter of fact, the defense attorney shouted, you are confused in the entire subject of how you carried at your conclusions in your bacteriological tests and testimony, are you not? I am not, replied Welch hesitatingly. Ford instantly seized upon the witness to ask if he said only, I am. The court interfered, stipulating that the witness did noticeably hesitate as to whether he would make his answer affirmative or negative. The police chemist read frequently as Ford drew from his admissions of ignorance concerning the necessity of making charts for such scientific work or as to what authorities he had referred to in drawing his opinions. Welch frequently admitted he could not recall either the name of the author or the book in which he obtained information on the subject. On August 16th, there was a big blow up in court. Fitz accused Pantages of bribery. I have prosecuted cases for a long time in this country, but I have never seen such a cold-blooded, deliberate attempt to suburn perjury as has been made by Alexander Pantages and Rodney Pantages in this courtroom. Defense argued that Fitz was attempting to intimidate their witnesses by arresting Biffle. And on this day, in Lynn, Massachusetts, Mayor Ralph S. Bauer banned the exhibition in local theaters of motion pictures showing women or girls smoking cigarettes. Other issues Mayor Bauer tackled were philandering husbands, women's bare knees, and taking down a cigarette poster that showed a sailor and a woman enjoying a smoke. On October 17th, Dr. Peter Sundin, a defense witness, threw a bolt into the trial testifying he examined Pringle four days after the alleged attack and found no signs of abuse. Contending that the reputation of Miss Pringle had nothing to do with her complaint of assault against Pantages, Superior Judge Frick ruled repeatedly against defense intimations that the girl's conduct with another man had not been proper. Leo Ziskit, 
a Syrian grocer of Garden Grove, was the medium through which Pantages attorneys tried to get such evidence into the records by asking about what he saw between Pringle and Duneev. Under Cross, Fitz got him to admit contradictory statements and testimony. On this day, a motion picture entitled Building with God was shown at the First United Presbyterian Church at 7.30 p.m. by Dr. McGranahan, Secretary of the Board of American Missions, and Dr. Raitt, the Synodical Superintendent of Missions. C.H. Hurd, optician with offices in Pantages Building, testified that only three or four minutes had passed since Pantages took Pringle into the room and she came out screaming. Reading from a typewritten statement, Prosecutor Robert P. Stewart asked, Did you not say to two investigators that you thought the first scream Eunice Pringle made was part of an act in the theater near your offices? Yes, sir. And that you thought the second scream was riot in the theater? Yes, sir. And did you not tell these investigators that you knew nothing of the case and that your son knew more about it? No, sir. Then did you not tell them that you did not want to get mixed up in the affair and that your son would go to the district attorney? No, sir. Heard testified he knew Pantages nine years. He's an optician and rents eight rooms on the second floor of the theater building Pantages formerly owned. His timeline of three to four minutes was challenged as it contradicted the state's timeline of half an hour. The consistency of the rhetorical and visual construction of the characters in the innocent predator narrative from the beginning of the Pantages case in mid-August 1929 to its conclusion near the end of October 1929 indicates that the difference in reporting for Pantages and Pringle was more than a simple matter of the supposed lack of press access to Pantages. It was the result of a discourse of stereotypes built by Hollywood and the news media of the time. It surprised few readers of The Examiner that on October 27, 1929, Alexander Pantages was found guilty on two counts of statutory rape of a minor and later was sentenced to 50 years at San Quentin Prison. Anyone who regularly followed the newspaper's sensationalist reporting of the case would have reached a similar conclusion. In the Pantages rape case, we see both the construction of white ethnicity and the demonization of the ethnic other. There exists on the one hand the image, constructed both rhetorically and visually in the pages of the examiner, of the successful Pantages as the Hollywood mogul, while at the same time we witness the trope of his demonization as a Greek immigrant and member of the Hollywood mogul elite. In the contest between these two fabrications, the more assuredly negative one won out, which speaks directly to ethnicity as invented, imagined, administered, and manufactured. A key link to this manufacturing process of both the lighter and darker aspects of white ethnicity is the nation's press, as exemplified by the Los Angeles Examiner. The manufacture of white ethnicity involves the creation and dissemination of narratives that are easily digested by the reading public. Pantages as the corrupted and foreign sexual predator and Pringle as the innocent native. This particular narrative, used in previous sensational trials, was designed to reduce the complexity of the judiciary process down to its simplest, most dramatic core, good versus evil. The result was less a courtroom trial than a theatrical production with a protagonist, antagonist, and supporting characters, or justice by drama, one might conclude. Because the immigrant's racial status was far from stable or permanent, a newspaper like The Examiner created such a theatrical trope because it could do so, and under First Amendment protection. It says something about this power of racialized construction of white ethnicity that the Greek American press seems to have ceded this privilege to the nation's mainstream newspapers. We may think that Greek American newspapers might have come to Pantages rescue, or at the very least, have spoken more neutrally about the rape trial itself. Yet this does not seem to be the case. The Seattle-based Washington Hellenic Review, for example, which before the trial in 1929, offered a steady diet of fluffy items on the goings-on of the extended Pantages family, was decidedly and peculiarly silent on the issue of his arrest and trial. Perhaps the review feared retribution or backlash from the public if it defended Pantages or, alternatively, decided that his arrest and trial simply did not fit within the constrained boundaries of the model ethnic that tugged at the contours of white ethnicity. 
given that the review did not previously hesitate to publicize injustice involving Greek America when it saw it. Its silence seems especially deafening. This Greek American press embargo against the case stretches into later historical accounts of Pantages' life. The visual and rhetorical construction of Pantages in the Los Angeles Examiner both commercializes the negative narrative representation of the theater mogul and racializes his existence. The allusions to his ethnic background are designed to isolate him from the rest of the courtroom characters, furthering his alienation as if his criminality as a social stigma were not enough. In contrast, Pringle's portrayal as the undeserved victim is meant to garner the reader's sympathy, as if America itself was the sufferer at the hands of a corrupt Levantine immigrant. As we might assume, the narrative construction process is never-ending. If one of the conclusions to be drawn from the newspaper coverage of the Pantages rape trial is how tropes are constructed and maintained, another is that narratives are also a terrain of contested meaning. While the process of narrativization itself may be stable and a constant and consistent feature of media content, the type and theme of a narrative may evolve over time as social circumstances change. The notion of contested meaning becomes visible through another narrative that emerged from the rape trial in which Pantages himself is presented as a victim and not a predator. This other narrative might have originated as a whispering campaign within the fertile subterranean world of the Hollywood Gossip Network. This other version of the story involves Joseph P. Kennedy, a great American family and pater of a future president, and has him allegedly using Pringle to force Pantages into selling him his valued theater properties. Ruthlessly determined to get his hand on Pantages theaters, Kennedy supposedly paid Pringle's manager $10,000 for Pringle to accuse Pantages of rape. The Kennedy narrative fosters an image of Pantages as a bumbling victim and it may be slightly more flattering than the narrative sold by the Los Angeles Examiner. But this hardly seems a consolation. Even as this other narrative confirms white ethnicity's contested historical terrain, it also reiterates the cultural constraints placed on ethnics. Not only does the newspaper coverage of Pantages' rape trial confirm the tension between journalistic impartiality and commercial pressures, it also speaks to the banality of reducing complex human beings into cardboard cutouts robbing them of their humanity and dignity. That Pantages was a family man who seems unlikely to harm his business reputation by having committed the rape charges leveled against him, and that Pringle was less the innocent portrayed in the pages of the Los An Angeles Examiner, i.e. her relationship with Dunaev, were elements that could not be included in the narratives disseminated. The inability of the Los Angeles Examiner to view Pantages as anything other than a European brute or Pringle as anything but the victimized innocent, indicates to what lengths this reductionist approach went. Of course, of the two reductionist portrayals, Pringle fared much better. This would add the discourse on criminalization as part of the discussion of white ethnicity. As a powerful storyteller, the Los Angeles Examiner created an image of Pantages that not only disparaged him through his ethnic background, but also vilified him and reduced his ability to be regarded as a fully developed human. This is not an insignificant point, since such portrayals over time can have a long-lasting, damaging effect on ethnic group portrayal in America. It is not simply a matter of academic interest that this reductionist representation in the nation's media, at the time, wrecked Pantages' livelihood and the jobs of many in his theater circuit. That it did so effectively and so quickly shows the deep social and personal damage caused by these very narratives. If Pantages is scantily remembered today, it is not only because he is the victim of historical amnesia, he is also the victim of the media stereotypes that upended his career. Whether he deserved this treatment or not is a matter of debate. But what seems beyond dispute is that his case is a valuable addition, and not only for its academic or historical interest, but for its far-reaching social implication to the discourse on the construction of white ethnicity. Pantages granted no interviews during the trial. He did, however, run into Klondike Kate in the hallway outside the court one day, and they briefly exchanged greetings. Kate found herself thrown back into the public eye when the district attorney subpoenaed her as a character witness against Pantages. She had been brought by the prosecution to court to testify in the criminal prosecution against Pantages, her ex-boyfriend, which she never did. 
Before she ever made it to the witness stand, the case wrapped up and Pantages was sentenced to 50 years at San Quentin. There are those who think the entire case was trumped up by a group of Yukon sourdoughs, angry about how he treated Kate. Not long after, Kate heard from another former admirer. His name was W. L. Van Duren, an accountant whom Kate had nursed back to health in 1930 at her Oregon convalescent home. Pantages went on trial in Los Angeles, and prosecutors subpoenaed her from Oregon to testify. As she waited outside court, reporters pounced Kate, who still relished an audience, told of her old love for him, posed for photographs, and dabbed her eyes with a handkerchief. In the end, Klondike Kate never took the stand because the character witness, whose testimony she was to balance, never showed up. Later, she said, I never testified against him because win or lose, a sourdough never squeals. Kate was shocked at Pantages' wan appearance and burst into tears when Pantages spoke to her civilly in a court corridor. It's been a long time, he said awkwardly. Those must have been happier days in the North, a bystander interjected. They were, Alexander answered, gazing at the floor. Maybe you think I'm not game. Look at what I'm going through here. Kate replied, Maybe you think I'm not going through anything myself. See again, Pantages said when the bailiff beckoned him back to court. Buoyed by that, she may have considered retribution and some heady national publicity generated by her trial appearance, Kate's spirits rose. Photographs during his first assault trial showed him unmoved by the tragic trial unfolding before his eyes. Often Pantages is shown lost in his own thought, but surrounded by lawyers and attendants. This contrasts sharply with Pringle, who was shown surrounded by her parents or with sympathetic state-appointed officials. Pantages was not allowed to speak to the press during the trial by his lawyers, a stricture not faced by Pringle. Thus, she gained the public sympathy. The standoffish nature of his personality extended to his relationship, or lack thereof, with other members of the Greek-American diaspora. If any segment of society was positioned to keep his memory alive, it was Greek Americans. But only in the last few years of his life did he make any serious attempts to reach out to other diasporas. Greek American publications at the time noticeably had little to say about his sexual assault trials. Only after he was exonerated, and with his empire a memory, did he have significant contacts with fellow Greek Americans. Had he done so earlier in his career, the community might have defended him during his trials and afterwards better kept his memory alive. It is not known if he reached out to them or them to him, but the result was a return to his roots that in some ways is a touching conclusion to an extraordinary story. Pantages' illiteracy certainly shielded him from fuller knowledge of the widespread social opprobrium against Hollywood in the 1920s, but it did not help his case that he showed a remarkable blindness or disregard to the social winds swirling around him. The man who made customer care his number one business priority apparently gave little thought for the cultural threats blowing against Hollywood. This could be a case of a business owner who paid attention only to his work, remaining completely blind to the popular perception of Hollywood as the center of sin and moral filth. It surprised few that on October 27, 1929, Poor Pantages was found guilty in a jury trial, convicted and sentenced to 50 years in prison, despite his claim that he was set up. The verdict came as a surprise to Pantages, who had hired very expensive New York lawyers to defend him, and was subsequently jailed for several months. The press made Pantages the nation's best known wealthy old goat in a sordid scandal. The negative publicity led to the selling of the second theater, his 1915 theater, along with other holdings. This set into motion a whirlwind of events that resulted in the total destruction of Pantages' chain, either by being sold or taken over by others. His arrest and conviction at his first trial that autumn in Los Angeles was major news, not only domestically but internationally. Both Pantages and his operations ceased to be a force in exhibition or vaudeville ever again. Some months prior to his arrest, Pantages had made moves to sell his operation or turn over some of his theaters to his two sons, Lloyd and Rodney. The trial sped up those efforts, destroying his reputation in the process. At his arrest, he claimed he was being framed, but he did not cite any names. Later, Hollywood gossip filled the blank by declaring Joseph P. Kennedy, 
the patriarch and future father of an American president, was behind the effort. Soon, a narrative emerged that Kennedy had paid Pringle $10,000 to accuse Pantages of sexual assault so that he could take over the Pantages circuit, then the largest remaining independent chain in the country. Pantages always maintained that Pringle had framed him, and later commentators speculated that Joseph Kennedy had bribed her to compromise the Greek magnet and acquire his theaters for a low price. The absence of evidence against Kennedy is not proof that he may not have taken advantage of the scandal, especially since the Los Angeles Examiner, owned by his friend Hearst, was the forerunner of attacks against Pantages. This continued Pantages never-ending downward spiral in his health. Bad timing, the weeks preceding Black Monday, a foolish attempt on his part to influence witnesses, a hostile district attorney, a severe judge, and public outcry fueled by William Hearst's tabloids led to a prison sentence of one to 50 years. Pantages would be incarcerated in San Quentin until June 30th, when in the aftermath of several heart attacks and hospitalization, he was released on a $100,000 bond. Pantages sold the new theaters to motion picture companies, primarily RKO, and refocused his energies on vaudeville. Despite trying to bring up Pringle's not-so-virginal life before the alleged attack, Pantages was ultimately found guilty of rape and was sent to San Quentin where he was incarcerated for almost a year until his lawyers were able to get him released on bail, citing numerous health issues. The news of Pantages' conviction made global headlines. On the witness stand, Pantages tearfully denied what Pringle said had ever happened, but the dies of public opinion had already been cast against him. Pantages was found guilty as charged and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Luckily for Pantages, he was a very wealthy man, and he appealed the verdict. At his first trial, a group of private investigators, whom Pantages had hired, undercovered evidence that Pringle was little more than a base prostitute. But for some reason, the judge, probably an avid reader of the Herald Examiner, decided that this evidence was not admissible. The stock market crash of 1929 found Pantages fighting legal battles that ruined his health and claimed much of his fortune. In hindsight, it could be said that Pantages was a casualty of the brutal corporate wars fought in the motion picture industry during the 1920s. Pantages then engaged attorney Jerry Get Me Geisler, later to become famous as a divorce lawyer for Errol Flynn and Charlie Chaplin, and San Francisco lawyer Jake Ehrlich to file an appeal on his behalf. Geisler successfully petitioned for a new trial with the California Supreme Court, basing his argument on the original trial judge's exclusion of testimony relating to Eunice Pringle's moral character. 